Welcome to Access Chat. I'm really pleased that we've got Kurt Yeager here today with us. Uh, for those of you that don't know, Kurt's uh, starred in a number of really big TV series, including Sons of Anarchy and NCIS. Uh, really pleased to have you with us. Not only have you been an elite athlete, um, but you're also a, a great advocate for people with disabilities. So I'm delighted to have you here. Uh, it's really nice to have someone on a slightly different angle from what we normally do. So welcome. Thank you. Tell Thank us a you. little bit about your story. Huh? Tell us a little bit about your story. Um, oh, so yes. I, I was know. born a very small child. <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, I, I grew up in San Francisco. I've traveled around the world. I rode BMX for many, many years. I had good sponsors. You know, I got to ride around in many contests. Um, you know, doing backflips over jumps and just having a, a good time. And the whole time I was growing up, I had, you know, uh, went to college and did classes, just not knowing what I wanted to do. Uh, and at the same time, I slowly got into acting. I got into the acting world through riding bikes. Uh, they had asked me to come out and do some stunt roles, and I would do a flip over a jump, you know, for them. And they said, hey, can you say a line? You know, and I'd say a line the way they wanted me to say it. And they're like, that was brilliant. And I was like, really? Brilliant? <laughs> you know, and, and I was like, okay, this is pretty fun, you know. But I, I, I didn't really pursue it until actually losing my leg in a motorcycle accident. Um, I was uh, getting my geology degree in San Francisco. I was in a bad motorcycle accident. I ripped off my left leg. Tore my pelvis in half, tore my bladder in half, broke seven vertebrae, collapsed my lungs, broke all my right ribs, good concussion, ACL, MCL in my right leg, deep vein thrombosis in my calf, and I had this hangnail that made eating the jello in the hospital really difficult. So, you know, I mean, it was, it was one of those things that, you know, changed my life and everything in a new direction and I joined the community of disabilities, you know, and I didn't know anything about it. I had no clue about anyone's, you know, disability rights. I didn't know about the different disabilities. I didn't know some people like this wordage, some people like that, you know. I, there was no knowledge of it whatsoever except a friend named Jerry in high school who had, um, uh, not cerebral palsy, but, um, he had, he had, his, his legs were, um, uh, didn't function all the way. And I think it, he was from uh, the Philippines and I think he had uh, polio as a kid. Okay. So they okay. just, you know, weren't all the way developed. And that was the only person I knew who had a disability and he walked around with crutches and I didn't, you know, well, he was just a nice guy and no one cared. So, um, but you know, then I got into acting full time afterwards and it's just been, Great. I play characters with disabilities. I play characters without. Uh, I'm on the SAG and AFTRA's uh, committee performers for disabilities. Um, we try and get more disabled roles written for characters that have a disability. And then also uh, actors who have a disability, we're trying to get them in front of the screen both for disabled and non-disabled roles. Okay. So, so I'll have to explain for, for the, the British audience, SAG is the Screen Actors Guild, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. So, so, you know, it's, I mean, that's just, I guess, myself in a nutshell. I still ride motorcycles even after losing my leg. Um, I've gone to Africa and I'm went to the Canadian Rockies and I'm going to go to Thailand here in probably February. Um, is, that, is, that, is that for work or? or, or for, uh, sort of. It's a little work and play. I do, I do some uh, motorcycle riding with like Tour Tech, which is a company that makes all the adventure gear for um, uh, motorcycles. And then I've ridden motorcycles with BMW twice now. So BMW invited me to do their um, motorcycle race, the GS Trophy. Um, and it's, it's so cool. It's an adventure motorcycle race that you go from location to location, like going fast and adventuring and doing all these things and challenges. And they needed someone who could host on camera and be comfortable, um, but then also be as fast and can keep up with the competitors. So they decided to go with a one-legged actor. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, they have a habit of sponsoring actors. They sponsored, uh, what was it, uh, Charlie Borman and, and, uh, yeah, and McGregor. McGregor for the yeah. long way around. 
So. I've talked to Charlie a couple times on Skype, so um, we're talking about trying to do something together. Yep. We'll see if we can. Yeah, well, he's another he's another one of the dyslexic army. Yeah, he is. Yeah, he's a he's a he's got a role with the British Dyslexia Association. So nice, nice. Yeah. Have you but, guys had him on? No, not yet. Um, I can ask him. Well, maybe. That'd maybe be great. Like after this. No, that'd be great. Sir. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so you, you talked about be becoming an actor. Um, it's quite unusual to become an actor after acquiring a disability. That's quite it, not. It's not the normal career path. How, how have you found acceptance within within the media? Well, most of the acceptance is lip service. Um, you know, it's a lot of, you know, we, we'll do anything for you. Oh, well, you want to play an actual character without a disability, you know. They don't have a problem with it per se. They have a problem with it in, in actions. Meaning, um, it's very difficult for any actor to get auditions. Period. So that's first of all, right? So if you're a female actor, then you're having difficulties playing your own age because they want younger women to play the wife of a 50-year-old man and so on and so forth. So there's ageism. There's a lot of other isms in yeah. this industry. But with disabilities specifically, what's difficult is they're not casting actors with disabilities in non-disabled roles. And what that means is specifically, if there's a role for a lawyer. He's got salty hair, 45 years old, quick wit, and some charm. He comes into a courtroom and has five lines and leaves. They'll never see an actor in a wheelchair because that role didn't say he rolled into the yeah. uh, courtroom. And so what they do is they assume that a disability is a caricature trait. Okay. They assume that it's some kind of a, oh, look, at he's missing a leg, so that must mean he's sad. Or maybe he's overcoming things. Or why not he's just a guy with one leg? Or he's just a guy in a wheelchair? Like, it's like they don't think of it that way, so they never audition someone for those roles um, that has a disability. And because of that, they're basically saying, you can't work. You can't audition for work, you can't apply for work for a role that's not you, that's not disabled, that's not calling for a disability. So in a way they're breaking the law, but it's a it's it's semantics at that point. Okay. So but there are a few people in, in town that have been champion, you know, the the whole disabilities movement and trying to get more characters in both abled and non disabled roles. Um, you know, I, I've been one of the lucky ones in, in that I can, you know, hide my disability. You know, I I can run full speed. I can do backflips. Over yeah, exactly. Pants, sorry. Pants. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. um, trousers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you can wear <laughs> pants. You know, so yeah, you can cover up your prosthetic. Exactly, and no one has any idea. You know, someone missing two legs or uh, intellectual disability or uses some kind of accoutrement to help with their mode of transportation, they can't. And so they assume right away that someone's quality of life is based off of their own fear. I really and do that get behind you. I would think some of the easy things we should all do is everybody should be following Kurt Yeagerman. I mean, Kurt Yeager, I'm changing your name. And, um, but I mean, what I'm else really sorry, can what's, what, what's the handle? Can you? It's at, it's at Kurt, K-U-R-T-Y-A-E-G-E-R. -E -E so it's his name, which is smart. Um, very good branding there, Kurt. Yeah. Oh, but, um, thank you. So, but I know that we can follow you and we can retweet you and we can follow your career on social media, but at the same time, are there other things the community can do to get behind you, writing, uh, encouraging, um, you know, the, the studios to write in more roles, really good roles for people with disabilities? I mean, what would you recommend that the community of people with disabilities do to really get behind actors like you? 
Well, I mean, like you said, specifically for me, you know, following my Twitter account, growing the numbers, sharing the content, telling people to follow me, uh, makes Hollywood really look at me specifically and goes, oh, oh, Kurt's doing this audition and maybe we'll cast him or whatnot over another actor. You know, I mean, uh, as I go up against able-bodied characters, so uh, on a regular basis, I'm... Um, you know, uh, in a position where those followers can help me get a role just by showing how popular I am. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of writing in, you know, a lot of a lot of the community it seems to be a little fractured in that. Oh, you know, I'm I'm an amputee. No, I use a wheelchair. Well, I have a genital disease. No, no, no. Well, I'm an intellectually instead of sticking together, right? And you right. know, really being like, listen. If we focus in on one person and do this, then it'll happen, or at least one network and try and make it happen. But <clears throat> the idea has got to get to people with a name. It's got to be a simple, singular message. So if everyone wrote to like NBC, CBS, um, you know, and some of the big networks here in America or in the UK, you know, Channel 4 or Sky TV or whatever's there, um, and said, hey, I want to see Kurt Yeager. He was on these shows. He was on this show. He was on this show. And, uh, you know, like the, also like the BBC, yeah. And if everyone does that with me, all of a sudden my name gets in the, um, the lexicon of the individuals at the studios. So if I, what I would do is I would say, let's do three months of everyone writing about me to every single network they possibly can. And let's see what happens. Let's do an experiment. Yeah. I mean, it'll take a full year for something to fully happen, but we'll see it. it we'll see it completely, you know, um, if I start getting phone calls, I'm like, well, it's working. Let's keep going. And if I'm, you know, a series regular on a network and I'm raising money for other projects, um, that I'm doing right now, for instance, that have characters with disabilities in them because I've written them, you know, and I'm directing them. So I kind of think that I can handle the casting of who okay. gets in. Um, then it gives me a better option to come back and say, no, that disabled actor is going to play that disabled character, period, because I have more leverage. So it's really about leveraging one person. It's why, you know, in America, one person is a president of the country. Right. Because right. you need that leveraged position so everyone can go, well, what do you think? And then, you know, you put all of your collective weight into one person and they're going to make mistakes and not do everything perfect. But at least you can go, OK, it's, it's there. We're making progress with that. So if you put the position of leverage on one person, you know, someone like myself who's getting my Twitter followers to 200,000 and my Facebook fans to over 100 or 200,000. Then you've put your collective backing behind me and they go, wow, I think he's got something going on. And they want to back you. So that's a huge thing that the disabled community could do for me. And especially, I mean, how many disabled people are there just in America? Like 57 million? So around the world, there's got to be, what, three, four, five hundred million? No, a billion. So, a yeah. billion, okay. So there's a billion people and I have 70,000 followers I mean okay and if 1 billion people have one family member or a friend I mean you know I mean, it's insane what we could do uh, I agree and I would tell you just a couple of just a couple of points one thing that we see people make I I believe is a mistake and I know Neil and Antonio as well is not following fans back so one thing you could do right away to increase your following is to follow more people back. There's a strategy that Hollywood has, and they're failing, um, where they just are going to, you follow me, and I'm not going to follow you back. That's not social. So I'll tell you, the actors that are starting to see bigger influence are the ones that are following people back. So just something to consider. And, and, and another interact. thing. Yes. What? And interact as well. You know. And interact, yeah. right, because you're and, a star, yeah. Tell us what you're thinking, and and you do okay. that I, now, I, Kurt. I, yeah, you're doing that now. No, you're not, no. because people, you know, we can't help it. We like movie stars, especially, you know, we're, we, we're real bad about that in the U.S., so... Yeah. Um, 
social media. People forget social media social. So that's one recommendation I'd make right away. But also bringing the brands into it. You mentioned Toyota. I know that Toyota has really gotten behind some really uh, Special Olympics, and they got behind, um, oh, all of a sudden her name is going to jump out of my head, Amy. Amy. Amy Pretty Wright, and how how amazing. And so I, as an influencer, started, you know, uh, tweeting for Toyota and saying, you know, that's why I'm proud to be a Toyota owner. So bringing the brands, I think, into this conversation are going to yeah. really help. And we can't have 50 more, 54 million people do, you know, being the center of attention, but the Amy Purdy's, the Kurt Yeagers, the, you know, the focusing on some of the actors that are really fighting for our community, I think is yeah. a very good thing for us to do. No, yeah, I, mean, I have, I have a, a, you know, some amazing followers and, and I don't even consider them fans anymore because of how much we chat, you know, and it's like, um, Astrid from France, like she, yeah, she is amazing. Stuff. Like she's just the most amazing friend she's a friend now you know and it's like she goes out of her way to tweet you know um uh broadcasters she tweets to brands she you know she'll tweet to uh, uh celebrity personalities she she tweets to everyone and it's gotten me a lot of um interaction and connections and, yes. you know, it's absolutely imperative that everyone comes on and does that and says, hey, I think Kurt Yeager would be great um, driving a Prius. I think I want to see him that. So let's tweet that a lot. And they tweet, tweet whatever you want to tweet. If you want to see me using, you know, like uh, Nike shoes or Asic shoes or Lee shoes, well, then tweet, tweet them and say, let work together with Kurt. And then all of a sudden they call me, we talk, and I say, this is what we're doing. We can make a web series. Here's my production company. Here's what we do. Here's the cost of it. I'm not going to make any money. It's just how much it costs to do. Let's go out and make some videos. And then all of a sudden we've got, you know, more disabilities in front of cameras, and then I start connecting other friends of mine with them, and now we're supporting the people that we need to support. So, I mean, that's, that's huge for fans to do. So... Number one thing is get me to 200,000 followers. <laughs> we can do it. No, what, what is interesting from your part is how you can create content and create, and create your own story through pictures or videos. There, there are brilliant tools like you know, Meerkat or Periscope, Periscope where you can do a, a sort of a short behind the scenes video where you can go and interview the people that are with you at that time. You do that for five or ten minutes only. Yeah. And you can even plan and program it. So, on let's say January 15, I'm going to do this, and people will, will connect uh, at that time. So it's important that you take ownership of of your own of your own story, and you are, you are able to tell it in a in an interesting way. People really appreciate a level of uh, personal touch uh, in, in this in this uh, type of uh, communication. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's imperative to do so, you know. And I'm learning that more and more. And then it, it's difficult because you have a maximum 24 hours in a day. Yeah. And so, you're, okay, what am I going to do today? You know, am I going to go to my acting class and make sure that I'm doing something? Am I going to learn how to play the guitar better? <laughs> uh, you know, am I going to learn how to sing? Do I tweet? <laughs> uh, maybe I should write that screenplay that I'm going to, you know, be working on. Maybe I should work out. Oh, I should really call my mom. <laughs> okay, let me call my mom first, then I'll yeah. get to Good answer. Uh, she's been watching Access Chat with Kirk. He's now calling his mom. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's, it's complicated, but I hear what you're saying. I think that's very important. Um, but you can give people yeah. to help you, Kirk, yeah. so you don't have to do it all by yourself. No. And, yeah, and, yeah. And one of the things that we've done... Um, as Access Chat, we take on board the points that you've made quite rightly about the different disability groups being fragmented. We're a broad church here. You know, we, yeah. we, we will talk to anyone across all kinds of different disabilities and we cover different topics. So we're, we're really keen to have a very wide conversation and bring everyone in. That's my dog. Forgive the noise. <laughs> it's all right. Um, so, you know, 
very very keen to to sort of have these different conversations, these different angles. You you you, you mentioned that you're directing stuff. How, how are you raising the the money to to do all of these projects? You, do you find it particularly difficult to raise dis, uh, money for disability related projects? Or do you sort of couch it as a story and, 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 and sort of weave in the, the characters with disabilities later? I, I try to, you know, I mean, that's a, that's a big question. In terms of story creation, I try to write a story that I want to hear, that I think audiences want to hear. And then I create characters, you know, based off of my own analytics of how I think characters should populate a screenplay. And then... I don't write disabled characters. I write characters. And then I go, okay, which character can be played by someone using a wheelchair? You know, so for instance, if I have a fireman who's going to rescue a bunch of people out of a burning building, I'm probably not going to cast a guy using a wheelchair unless it's a comedy, which would be really funny. Um, (laughs) Make sure there's a ramp. Yeah, exactly. He's like, I have no ramp, build me. And then they build a ramp really quick for him to come down out of a green <laughs> field. Like, it would be really funny, like, to do those things. But, like, so I try and write just any kind of any kind of story I want and then cast it with a blind eye, essentially, saying I'm not going to pay attention to the proclivities of saying, you know, if I write this character from my perception of what it's like to be used a wheelchair, then I've already failed as a writer. So I'm just going to write the character doing his thing, and then I'll say, I'm going to cast that guy who uses a wheelchair who's really funny. And then I'll go ahead and in the uh, preparation, I'll rewrite some of the dialogue and some of the little funny scenarios based off of his input. And then, it, you know, because, you know, I, that's how I work in terms of creating that content for people and individuals that I don't have any experience being in, you know? Okay. Like, it's almost like, you know, how, like, Hollywood writes black characters or African-American characters. You're like, what does that mean? Like, what? So you're saying that they're not articulate? You know what I mean? Like, and I've read it. Oh, this is an African-American guy. Hey, Ma. I'm like, Really? <laughs> really, guys, you know what I mean. So it's like it's just crazy how they how they how they think about those things. Uh, but in terms of raising money, it's you know raising money for any film is difficult. It's very difficult. Can you imagine like coming to you guys and saying, "Hey, do you want to put ten thousand dollars in each for a film that may completely lose all of your money?" <laughs> you know, I mean, it's a very difficult task. Um, I'm raising a quarter of a million dollars right now for a small feature film that's going to probably make, you know, two, three times its money. Um, I cannot guarantee that, but I'm going to do everything in my power to make that happen. And so far, we've got about 60,000 raised in a week and a half. So that's pretty fast, but that's, you know, it, it's it's a quarter of a million dollars. If there's a, a, a rich, disabled businessman out there who's got a lot of money and connections, call me up. Let me know. Tweet me. Reach out. Reach out to Deborah. She's got my email. Um, <laughs> because I will be a good steward of your money, and I will put disabled characters in the project, and it will be coming from a disabled director and writer. So we're building the community, and someone's got to put their money where their mouth is. Yeah. You know, so if you want to support someone like myself making content, then let's support me at a small level and raise the money and and go out and make it. And when I, you know, when the film makes four or five times its money, oh, wow, that was good. Then people start coming on the bandwagon and so on and so forth. So are you you using um, crowdfunding at the moment? No, I I haven't used crowdfunding. No, No, I haven't used it at all. There's two problems with crowdfunding. You, 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 you get into like – with a lot of content, you're basically giving it away. You're giving away the idea of the content. And the more you give away sometimes, the better it helps you and the worse it hurts you because – Distribution companies a lot of times and other companies, they want the content 
to feel more Hollywood. You know what I mean? They want it to feel like a film. And if you've done all the crowdfunding and everything with a feature film, a lot of the content and behind the scenes and all that stuff's already there. So people aren't as interested, I guess, in showing that kind of a film because it feels cheap. It doesn't feel like a real Hollywood film, which is such a stupid concept. <laughs> But that is. And, and it's also difficult for a film because it's not a project that is tangible. I'm making this phone. This phone's going to be amazing. If you give me 20 bucks, then I'll give you, like, a picture of this phone. If you give me $100, then you get the first phone made. If I say, hey, if you give me $50, you'll get a picture of me signed that I normally give away for free. Excellent. <laughs> yeah, that sounds like a bargain. The yeah. reason I the reason I was asking is because there've been a bunch of films around disabilities, particularly around dyslexia, actually, where people have crowdfunded the the production costs. However, they are, like you say, fairly homemade, um, homespun affairs. Uh, and, yeah. and, and if you really and what theaters were that, they in? Pardon? What theaters were they in? Yeah, exactly. It's not it's not the crowdfunding that you have to question. It's the result of how many people saw it. Absolutely. Straight to you. So there's a disconnect between those two portions. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. That's hard. I mean, I would love to crowdfund. You know, I mean, if, if you know, 100,000 people gave me $2, I would be funded tomorrow. That's another reason why having a big Twitter following would help. You know, hey, everyone, give me two bucks. Oh, give me five bucks. But you see what I'm saying? Like, that's its own awesomeness. And I'll be like, hey, everyone will be a producer. Yeah. Like, what does that mean? Nothing. But <laughs> when you get into the massive numbers and you can reach people, then you could do something like that. You know, hey, I'm going to make another film at $250,000. Uh, I've got 400,000 followers. Everyone give me $5 and I'll make a film. And I promise it will have this, this, and that. And the longest credits ever. Yeah, and the final, longest credits. Final ever. credits rolling. Exactly. Two hundred thousand. But I mean, you could you could do something, you know. I mean, it would be it would be fun. Like it'd be so fun. But I mean, that's that's a difficult task in itself. Hey, can I have your money? Ah, do I feel like a a beggar? You know, I mean, in a business sense, it's different. Where I come up and I say, hey, guy who's you know making a couple hundred thousand dollars a year, would you like to put twenty thousand, thirty thousand dollars into a film? Here's the business plan. Here's the structure. Here's how we're going to make the money back. Here's the film. Here are the actors. Here's the location. And we explain it all. But you can't give that away in a social media format because you're essentially saying, here's my blueprint and the behind the scenes sure. content sure. that I can't share with you. Uh, so, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, in LA, you are working with some, uh, some associations in, that work with disabilities. Now, can you tell us about that type of work and how you uh, connect with, with other people, how th that association works? Uh, yeah, um, I, SAG and AFTRA is the um, actors' union here in Los Angeles, and they do all North America, and you know they kind of extend out into other countries too in terms of protection of actors. Um, and I'm on a committee called Performers with Disabilities, and we're trying our darndest to work with like the legal aspects and work with the networks and the network executives to make sure that more writers are writing characters that have a disability and that casting directors are auditioning people who have a disability for nondescript roles, that directors want to work with um, disabled actors in order to um, uh, be authentic, you know, and not have something where it's like, you know, uh, a fake, you know, oh, look at that. Person. He's totally not doing it right, you know, and trying to be real. And then producers to let them know that there's no increased insurance costs, you know, there's no increase to difficulty. There is no time delay. There is no, there's no, there's no disadvantage to hiring a person with a disability. In fact, there's only an advantage. Um, one of the big things that I say to a lot of directors is film is a visual medium. If you cast someone with an interesting disability and you never talk about it, it makes the audience think. That's it. It makes them go like, you know, if I walk in and I have, you know, something wrong with my hand and we don't talk about it, I'm like, hey, man, I'm going to hold you up at the liquor store or whatever, you know, and it's like, 
we don't even talk about it, but that weird hand, you're like, is that playing into it? Is that made him mad? Did that make him angry? Did it mean anything? That's perfect for audiences. So picture, you know, speaks a thousand words. So like, why have the same guy doing it? You know, try and move that, that needle to make them realize it. Uh, have you guys ever done any sort of national campaign? How you use the fact that you know you are part of the community, you have a group, how do you synchronize and how you can find ways in order to, to promote that within the, the association? Yeah, they, they have, you know, uh, they have the disability awards that ceremonies that they have. They work with the other unions, the WGA, which is the Writers Guild, the PGA, which is the Producers Guild. Uh, they work with the unions and whatnot to, you know, try and get more... Uh, people aware of it. In terms of campaigns, it's very difficult because SAG represents all actors, not just actors with disabilities. So if they start spending money of the union dues from everyone to promote just disabilities, then all of a sudden that they're 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 leveraging a, a position by accident. Um, so there are some national campaigns, and they work with. Uh, brands and you know trying to big contacts, but they do have some restrictions that they just can't step out of. So really, it's it's on us. It's really on us. The, the four of us right here, right now, is what's going to make the real difference. It's not it's not relying on the the big machine to help us out. You okay. know, we have to create it. You know, and that's what I've been trying to accomplish. So I'm in the committee, and I know its limitations, and it's really good, but I know its limitations. And it's um, it's but it's it's more about us coming together and making something happen and doing it and having a driving force. Um, so, and that's a difficult thing because a lot of people they fear the unknown. They're afraid of failure. They're afraid of success. You know, there's a lot of things, and people go, "Wow, you're Kurt. You could do so many things. How do you do all those things?" And I go, "They're like, you're not even afraid." And I'm like. I'm horribly afraid, you know, <laughs> I'm just as afraid as everyone else. I just don't let it stop me. I just go, oh, my gosh, I'm so afraid. Let's go ah! and see what happens. I mean, you people don't understand that failure is the process of success. You cannot get success without failing. If you're a baby learning to walk, how many times did you fall on your butt? before you learn how to walk. If you fell five, 10, 15 times and then quit, you would never walk. So if you go into, let's say, acting and you do 15 bad auditions and you're like, I'm so horrible, that's silly. You can only learn through mistakes. <laughs> yeah. So you have to like make mistakes and that's okay. It doesn't feel good, but that's part of the process. So, you know. So I, I, I wonder, how much, you know, obviously you had to learn to walk twice over. Um, you, you came back from some very severe injuries. Do you think that that has perhaps given you that, that greater determination to, to push yourself, mm -hmm. having, having sort of come back from, from the edge that yeah, maybe some of the other people are lacking? Yeah, I mean, I, I think so. It's, it's done a couple things. One it made me realize how tentative life is. It made me really understand that life is fleeting and it can be taken from us at any moment. So the idea that my time is short is in my mind. You know what I mean? Like I understand. Sure. Uh, I also learned about what um, my family and friends are all about who they really are, the ones who came together to help me. You know, I learned everything about that. And then in terms of the disability and having the injury and that much time that I spent in the hospital, it taught me that the only way you overcome things is through effort, through blood, sweat, and tears. You know, a couple months after getting out of the hospital, I was very... Um, that's the word. Um, I was emaciated. I was weak. I, I lost 55 pounds. You know, I was, it was bad. It was really bad. And I decided, you know what? I don't have a leg yet. You know, 
other people were like, well, wait until you get your legs so you can start working out. And I was like, no, I got to start working out now. So I got in a wheelchair and I would push around the neighborhood and go for a mile and then go for two miles and go for three miles and start building myself back up. And that's made me incredibly tenacious. I mean, I don't know how many people want to go to Hollywood and actually try to be an actor and then make it happen without knowing anyone in the industry and not being rich because I'm not from a rich family. Having no means to do it, just going out there and doing it, accomplishing it, and then going, yeah, I'm going to direct content too, and then making a production company eight years ago, and then raising money for the first project, and then doing 10 short films, and then doing our first feature film a couple years ago, and then doing branded content for giants like Cadillac and Chevy, and then being on this chat right now, like, everyone's like, that's amazing, and they put, like, that you on a pedestal, and I'm like, I'm just trying, <laughs> you know, I'm just trying my best, I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're striving, and, and, yeah. and I think that's that's it. You know, if we don't strive, we don't succeed. So exactly, exactly. I think we've got some great. Free no, no, for you. I would like. You have a project coming. You know, you can you tell us about the pro the project that you are in and. Yeah, the, actually, yeah. now I have I have two more now. Well, two total. Um, I'm in a new show for Cinemax called Quarry, and um, Quarry is a show about two guys from 1970s who go, it's, it's a period piece, really cool. Uh, and they come back from Vietnam and they are military veterans, they're not treated very well in the country, they um, come back and they fall into a, a contract killing. And they decide that that's what they're gonna do for a living. And uh, Let's just say they try to kill me, and it doesn't go very well. <laughs> so uh, that's one reason. I mean, I play, and I play. I'm sorry, everyone. I play a very, very, very bad character. So, <laughs> that like that. I'm sure that will go down well. Yeah, it's it's great. I I mean, I I'm I have big, huge chops, and I have you know, big old uh, Fu Manchu, and I'm just like, look, yeah. oh, it's great. <laughs> Uh, and then I just did a film called um, Ultimate Legacy for the Hallmark Channel. Uh, I just finished. I just got back from filming in uh, Louisville, uh, Kentucky. And uh, great time, great story. The um, writer is um, Stovall. He's a motivational speaker. He's blind. So uh, he wrote the books. He, he, the series, and they turn them into movies. Um, J James Stovall, Jim Stovall, I think it is. Mm -hmm. um, so I was in his his project, and it was great too. It's a nice story about uh, a young man who's given um, an inheritance from his grandmother of a significant amount, and the question is, is he going to do the right thing or the wrong thing? And he has to figure out what's the right thing to do, and what's important in life, and what having a legacy really means. So really cool, really nice story. And then of course I'm raising money for mine, so if there's any rich people, feel free to give me a call. No, you, you have traveled, you have, you have traveled to different places. You know, you have been, you have been in London, you have been, uh, do you have any travels in your agenda or anything? Yeah, yeah, I'm, uh, I might be going to Spain in November. I'm probably gonna go to Baja. Uh, I'm gonna ride, I think I'm gonna ride motorcycles from LA to Baja. Um, to like La Paz or something, uh, maybe do a couple articles or, or whatever. Maybe some. You guys are telling me how to do hashtags and whatnot on Twitter, so maybe people can follow along. And then in uh, in 2016, I'm going to uh, Thailand with BMW for the new GS Trophy race. So that's going to be really fun to follow along. And BMW puts out videos um, of me going along on the trip. So. Uh, you can follow along on uh, the YouTube channel there and see the adventure. And we, I did Canada last year with them. That's on my channel, uh, which is everything. And everything is either Kurt Yeager or Crowbar, which is an old nickname of mine. Uh, <laughs> which is it's, that's a whole new chat. That's I can't I can't get it. <laughs> um, but yeah, yeah. So you know, people can follow along at all of my you know. Uh, uh, social media stuff. It's all Twitter and Facebook and Instagram are all just my name, Kurt Yeager. So 
but yeah, these travels are amazing. I get to see wonderful places and beautiful people. I went to Africa with BMW and Tour Attack, and um, that was probably the most impressed, impressive place I've been, and, and the people were unbelievable. So kind and nice and friendly, and most of them spoke English, so it was so weird. I'm like, um, can you direct me gasoline? And they're like, oh yeah, the gas station's down the street. <laughs> I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, it's, it's been eye-opening getting to travel all over it's been fun yeah so um what do you what do you guys think i should do to like get more like social media followers what can we what number do you think we, i can hit with you guys oh i don't know but we can we we can get engagement you'll um i think you'll enjoy tomorrow night um yeah you'll 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 see your feed light up um, and, and we'll we'll take it from there. Um, yeah. I think that this should yeah. be a conversation that we have over many months. It's not just going to be a a quick one hour blast here. I think some of the topics you've covered are really interesting, and we need to bring you in as an ambassador. And likewise, we will spend all of the time promoting our ambassadors. You know, or yeah. or just giving you uh, Ferrero Rocher, um, which. Uh, <laughs> The, the ambassador always holds the most. Uh, it's a very old European ad. I'll have to send you the link to the ad. But the, there's a, a 1970s ad. But the ambassador always holds the best parties, and they bring you these crappy little Ferrero Rocher <laughs> chocolate. Um, no, we definitely want to um, bring more people to the front that are, are prepared to talk and talk openly and be um, yeah. good, good ambassadors for. A, a, a wide collective movement rather than the fragmented situation that we currently have. And we're working to engage with businesses as well because the, the initial rationale behind Access Chat, as Deborah will have told you, is is the fact that we all know and we work within big businesses or work with them that they're all doing stuff, but it's all behind the scenes. It's all hidden. Um, you know you know what's interesting? You just brought up a point that makes me think about something that that can be done. One thing is, you know, if everyone wanted to reach out to brands and say, hey, we want Kurt Yeager as your ambassador for your brand for national commercials. I mean, that gives me a giant platform immediately and, you know, a lot of FaceTime as a person. So naming a brand that, I mean, if you said Walmart or Home Depot, I'm just naming any store. Hey, Kurt Yeager here, we're going to do some home improvements. doesn't matter what it is, you know, and, and, and. That's a massive thing for an actor to get. Yeah, uh, a big campaign like that for a commercial brand, because absolutely. I mean that that's one way to bypass Hollywood, um, and then say we're putting our our pin in in this guy, using it, getting to brands which are easier to get to sometimes than Hollywood people. Uh, but it has to be a giant national yeah, advertiser, so, and then if you do that, then all of a sudden Holly goes, "Oh, that's that guy," and then they and yeah, so you know, we, we had that in the UK with BT. BT, our national telecoms company, um, they they used Oscar Pistorius, <laughs> which was fantastic for a well, while. Uh, yeah, I I have so many jokes that I should not right. say. So. Right. Okay. So, right. so yeah. Neil, we are about to close. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, thank you very much. It's been a it's been a fun chat. Uh, I know we we'll we'll carry on. Um, thank you again. Uh, yeah. Sorry for all the technical problems today. We'll stick. No, no, no. Better. It's great. Great. I think so, I think it's been fantastic. I mean, guys, just the fact that you invited me on here makes me feel special. Just that I get to chat with your you know fans makes me feel good. Um, that you've opened up your home and your, you know, Skype network and Twitter people. I mean, that's, you guys are helping me out just by doing this. So I'm honored to be with you guys and just chatting and seeing if we can't make a, you know, everyone says, I want to make a little bit of, screw a little bit of a difference. Let's make a big difference. You know, let's go out there and do it. I mean, if I can make 15 films over the next five years and every there's disabled characters in it, we're going to make a big difference. You know, I mean, it, it, it we can we can change the world we just have to decide to change the world together
Yeah, yep. you've got to have ambition. Yeah. Right. We're going to close yep. now. So thank you very much once again. So yeah.